gun and then lift the back of the uh, main rib. Look at the back of the lid. And then, being here. I was in hope that, uh, that we would be victorious and as a result we'd be able to approach Mr. Lincoln about giving us our yeah. individual If you look at the South, it was Thank an agricultural so society. They had very few railroads, almost no public transportation. So the gist of this is, is that if you live in the South and you want to get anywhere, you either ride a horse or you go in a buggy that's pulled by. train the 11th Pennsylvania this weekend. Uh, they fought on the first day uh, the heavy casualties, uh, helped re repel Iverson's brigade, famous charge by the Confederates. Um, they assisted back on Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill the uh, second and third. Extra Billy Smith saw dust on the Hanover Road he thought it was Yankees coming up on the rear. He sent his son, which is a courier, to General Ewell, and said, we got Yankees coming up on the rear. So he took, kept General Smith's brigade, and took a couple regiments out of General Gordon's brigade to protect the rear, which when they should have been taking Culp's Hill. If they had taken Culp's Hill, we could have gotten guns up there. The battle would not have been fought here. We would have had artillery superiority. We could have fired all the way down the line. They would have had to retreat closer to Washington. The battle would not have been fought. Yep. John Bell Hood, commanding Hood's division, First Corps, Longstreet's Corps. By Battle of Gettysburg, I led my division on the second day. I uh, started off the echelon attack for a little rocky hill now called Little Round Top. We did uh, the boys did do a fantastic job. The Texans and brigade well. They fought hard, fought well. We took Devils Den. We got to the basically the sum of that little top uh, before we return back. I get injured in that battle, I take a shrapnel wound in my shoulder and I'm carried off the field uh, until my brigadier, senior brigadier McClaws, mm -hmm. takes over, it's an hour, it's gonna be about an hour 
the transcribes. And that hour gives the union plenty of time to reinforce. It also allows, uh, as we all know now, the 20th Maine to come in and do a wheel maneuver. So the next attack, next two attacks that go up there, uh, there should not have been anybody there, but there was. Battle of Gettysburg, what it means directly to me is, uh, unfortunately, a lost opportunity. There was a lot of mistakes made on both sides, I guess, but uh, I just felt that for me, had we done a flanking maneuver that day, we could have been in their supply lines, cut them off, and we would have had them. He tried to left, he tried to right. As a matter of fact, I pulled a lot from the right and the left and put it in the middle. While a lot of the guys only went on the Napoleonic tactics, I went one step better and wrote about the Roman tactics and the Roman War and how Caesar moved his armies from one place to another and built these great forts.
My name is uh, Major Waite. I'm the surgeon here in the 117th Year Volunteers. This is where we do all the major amputations. Thousands of amputations were done at Gettysburg. Uh, a lot of wounded men out of the field being brought into hospitals. Uh, a lot of hospitals were in houses, barns. At Gettysburg, well, there was over 50,000 uh, killed and wounded uh, during the Battle of Gettysburg. And it was a three-day battle. Uh, a lot of wounded. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, Union Army had a plenty of ambulances available. They had over 200 here available on the battlefield to be able to get men off of the field and to the hospitals quickly. Otherwise, the casualty rate would have been high. Yeah, we are the civilians of Gettysburg. We gave aid and comfort to the visitors that came to Gettysburg in 1863, June through November and on. Our winter wheat had been harvested, but the corn, knee high of the 4th of July, had been harvested with mini balls and ordnance. So we didn't have a corn crop that we could harvest uh, without purchasing more corn. The biggest problem that we had, of course, was contamination of our ground. The ground here is the same now as it was in 1863. You've got one foot of topsoil and then you have Mother Earth or the parent material of Triassic red beds, um, red sh uh, shale, and clay. So uh, we had to use other methods of dealing with horses uh, because we'd have to mound a lot of soil on top of them to eliminate the flies and the stench. So we had to burn them. We piled them up, sprinkled coal oil on them, and we struck a match. Several piles of them emanating the smell of burning flesh for several weeks. As far as the dead men were concerned, trenches were dug as we see depicted in this uh, image right here. Uh, and if we had any information at all regarding that corpse, we'd put it on a plaque, write something on it, bury them, uh, cover them over. Loved ones would come back later, disinter, and take them off, probably in embalming, perhaps ice, ice them down and, and, and send them away uh, on trains. My name is Jolene Spooky Riley, and I'm from Gettysburg Ghost Tours. Well, this was the 150th anniversary reenactment event. We're very proud of it. And of course, we were here in the event tent number one, doing historical presentation as well as ghostly tales from beyond the grave with uh, Charles Finley and Jolene Spooky Riley. <laughs> The organizers did a fab job of putting this all together. I think they did a great job. And the spectators, well, they came out in droves, and naturally the reenactors, you know, we have to thank them too. They did an awesome job. Everybody has their own favorite yeah. battles, of course, but yeah. the, I mean, everybody wants to come to Gettysburg, so it's, you can see by the numbers of people, it's it's a big thing. It's the apex of reenacting, I guess you want to say. Oh, yeah. A big round of applause. My name is Eric Tapp from Ohio. How long have you been doing reenactment? Uh, about 13 years. Ah. Uh, how long have you been riding horses? Uh, about 20. <laughs> yeah, so who do you represent? Sixth Ohio. Sixth Ohio, let's see. Well, we were involved in the battle and we did courier duties. There's 10 different companies per regiment, so different companies got different signs. Uh, and what do you think about this reenactment? Well, it's nice to have a nice crowd. My name is Mario, I'm originally from Brooklyn, I currently reside in the lovely state of New Jersey. Well, I see you're dressed as a Confederate. Yes, I am currently a member of the 12th, 12th South Brooklyn Confederate, <laughs> South Brooklyn. So what do you like about the uh, CSA? 
Uh, it's strange. Uh, I've been doing. I do both sides. I'm mostly Confederate, and for many years I walked into the Confederate camp, and they mentioned I have a slight accent, <laughs> slight New York accent, just a slight. Yeah. yeah, and they would say, "Why are you here?" And I would joke around, saying, "I'm from <laughs> South Brooklyn." I think it stems from growing up watching the Waltons, ah. and the Virginians connect more with mm. farmers, southerners, and this yeah. union of mostly city. Oh, mm. Other than that, politically or racism, I had yeah. nothing to do with it. I just kind of bond more with the southerners. Ah, I see. <laughs> so, as reenactors, what do you think about Battle Gettysburg? We come out here, this is my 14th year consecutive oh, coming out, so <laughs> there's something there. Yeah. How about this year? This year is, in my lifetime, I will never see this many reenactors congregate in one location again in my life. Wow. So that's... Yeah. History belongs here. All of us have the passion that we have, and that's what brought us together to honor those who walk those fields. And to be here today in front of you, it truly is an honor. So thank you very much.